Let's begin in the west of the continent, where President Bola Chinubu has condemned the mislabeling of Nigeria as a hub for cybercrime and corruption, asserting that such blanket stereotyping undermines the integrity of the majority who uphold principles of diligence. And speaking at a public engagement on youth, religion and anti-corruption organized by the EFCC in Abuja on Wednesday, President Chinubu emphasized Nigerians' significant contributions globally. The president, who was represented at the event by his deputy, Vice President Kashim Shetima, noted that, on the contrary, Nigerians are meticulous, authentic citizens who have been making significant contributions to innumerable fields of endeavors around the world. President Shinobu admitted that cyber crimes have evolved into a global phenomenon, but assured the anti-graft agency of the government's support and its quest to combat these digital offenses and neutralize the threat caused by other forms of corruption head on. And the fourth Brexit. <laughs> Over the decades, Nigerians have been victims of mislabeling, such gross misrepresentation fails to reflect the true essence of our diverse and resilient nation of 226 million people. With the most thriving immigrant community in the United States are the Nigerian Americans, 60% of whom have gone to college. The association of internet crimes within the entire Nigerian populace lacks statistical evidence and does not align with the sociology of everyday Nigerians. Our nation comprises hardworking, honest citizens who contribute significantly to various fields globally, from medicine to artificial intelligence. While we reject blanket stereotyping that undermines the majority of holding principles of integrity and diligence, we must face the fact that we function in an interconnected world where cyber crimes have evolved into a global phenomenon. This poses a threat not only to our nation, but to the entire world. In the meantime, Chairman of the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, Ola Olukoyede, has revealed the agency's discovery of a religious sect laundering money for terrorists. Speaking during a public forum on youth, religion, and fight against corruption, as well as the launch of the Fraud Risk Assessment Project for ministries, departments, and agencies, Olukoye did disclose that the EFCC was investigating a 13 billion naira fraud case with 7 billion naira traced to a religious group's account. He emphasized the widespread involvement of religious entities in money laundry. The EFCC boss vowed to pursue justice and recover stolen funds despite facing legal barriers from probing the religious organization's leaders. The one-day event is aimed at addressing the challenges of youth involvement in cyber crimes and how religion could be used as a weapon for their reorientation. The Public Accounts Committee of the House of Representatives has erected the Federal Fire Civil Service to reimburse the sum of 1.48 billion naira to the Federation account within the span of a week. This action follows the revelation that the service received intervention funds for the COVID-19 health epidemic but failed to provide an account for their utilization. The committee, led by Bamidele Salam, issued the directive on Wednesday after the Federal Fire Service failed to appear at the investigative hearing for the third consecutive time. Deputy Chairman Jeremiah Omar spearheaded the motion for the refund, highlighting the necessity for the accountability, particularly as numerous other agencies have cooperated with the committee's investigative investigation into COVID-19 intervention funds. Simultaneously, the committee has dispatched fresh invitations to several other defaulting ministries, departments and agencies of the federal government. Now, these entities are summoned to appear and address various queries stemming from the Auditor General of the Federation's report on the allocation and utilization of billions of Naira as COVID-19 intervention funds. Oyo State Governor Sheyi Makinde has taken a decisive action by signing into law Executive Order 001-2024 aimed at regulating the handling and storage of harmful substances within the state. In a critical section of the order, Governor Makinde issued a stand 72-hour ultimatum for individuals possessing any form of explosive to declare them immediately. 
This development comes in the wake of a tragic explosion that shook the capital, Ibado, on January 16, resulting in five fatalities, 77 injuries, and the destruction of 58 homes in Adeyi area of Old Bodija. Governor Makinde, while addressing the media, expressed confidence that the implementation of this new law would significantly reduce the likelihood of a recurrence of the January 16 explosion. He noted that the executive order takes immediate effect. Is, uh, on handling explosive, uh, on handling, uh, uh, on handling uh, uh, substances that are dangerous, that are harmful. It may not just be um, uh, explosives. They're not supposed to be walking around with uh, acid, for instance. So if you are caught in Oyo State, you know, um, um, not following uh, uh, the law on how to handle such substances, the law will take its course. Anybody, any company or individual that is in possession of harmful substances stored in residential houses should notify the state government of the possession of such substances. And this obligation takes effect immediately. So they are required to report within the next 72 hours. The 6th Division Nigerian Army on Wednesday said it uncovered a massive illegal refinery camp and seized 5 million liters of stolen crude oil stored in a reservoir in River State. The General Office Commanding 6th Division Major General Jamal Abu Salam said the illegal refinery was uncovered along the Mirinwai channel of Imo River in the Komkom area of Oyungbo, local government area of the state. He said troops found about 5 million liters of stolen crude oil stored in a reservoir, adding that the powerful people were behind oil theft given the scale on which it was being perpetrated. The new discovery is coming about a week after the military discovered about three millions of crude oil in an illegal refinery at Adagua in the Echa local government area of River State. Election stakeholders in Nigeria have called on the nation's legislature to ensure the speedy resolution of election dispute. They say they want dispute cases resolved before winners of elections in the country are sworn in. Our correspondent Idong Joseph reports. The election adjudication process is almost over, mainly in disagreement with the conduct of Nigeria's general elections and the results declared by the nation's electoral body. Despite Nigeria's apex court finally resolving many of the disputes before it, there are many who think there are areas in the process that need improvement. Key findings were that transparency and access to information was a little bit open, but again, very challenging. Uh, so we need to ensure and engage uh, tribunal secretaries going forward in the future uh, so that we can have some level of access. Uh, the second thing we found out were bureaucracy in terms of accessing information and this bureaucratic process uh, particularly inhibited our trained observers from assessing relevant public documents at the election petition tribunal uh, in most states. Uh, the tribunal secretaries oftentimes will refer you uh, to the appeal court in Abuja uh, to go and secure permission. Despite election disputes not new to Nigeria, advocates are calling for a review of legislation, bordering on the timing for the conclusion of this dispute. They say they want laws enacted that will compel political office holders removed by the court to refund benefits received while in office. All electoral disputes must be concluded before the swearing in of a particular political office holder. And the reason why this is so is that the taxpayers' monies are actually draining on a regular. If they can do that, it will help us. Secondly is that when you look at it, when somebody, how many people, I don't know, they need to come and tell us that have been sworn in and they have stayed in office for a number of uh, maybe months or even years. And how many of them have we had that they have returned the money they collected? And the person who is supposed to be the beneficiary, not in the terms of governor, but in terms of the members, were they able to pay them? 
I think it shouldn't have been in the first instance. So these are kind of signals that um, we're worried about, and I'm happy that um, we, we hope that when we share this document, and I know a number of civil society have done review of the whole electoral uh, circle, that the government will listen to us and together we'll be partners in reviewing the electoral process and make it more acceptable and less persons will go to court because the recent contradictory judgment by the court also raised concerns about the integrity of the judiciary. Stakeholders here said the judiciary must assert its independence to really be the hope of the common man. In Abuja for New Central, I am Idong Joseph. Thank you for staying tuned. As the shipping industry in Nigeria accelerates its support for the global effort to combat climate change by moving towards decarbonization, a seafarer's voices and actions are key to ensuring a just transition to zero carbon future. Now, seafarers have always played a critical role in helping to protect the health of the ocean and the planet, and the role is increasingly important. Every day at the sea, they help to enforce the International Maritime Organization's environment-related treaties by implementing rules on garbage, sewage, and air pollution prevention. To discuss this further, to discuss Seafarer's role in ensuring just transition to zero carbon future, I'm being joined live in the studio by the President Maritime Professional Forum, Captain Akombi Uluwashegun. Good afternoon, glad to have you join me. Yeah, good afternoon. Now, seafarers are indeed the unsung heroes and, of course, uh, the most important components of the maritime value chain. How do you think, how do you think their actions you know, are critical in ensuring just zero transition you know, for carbon future? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, the seafarers, as operator of these vessels within the coast, uh, the zero uh, carbon emission is coming as a, as a requirement by HIMO. And uh, the annex of uh, Annex 6 of the MAPO Convention actually talks about the air pollution. And uh, we have the, uh, fuel, the type of fuel we operate on. So you see all this uh, affecting the vessels, uh, the kind of vessel, the beauty of the vessel, and training requirements for the seafarers. So if we have to meet up with uh, the uh, zero carbon emission, we as seafarers, we need to have that in our training, start, start training uh, the engineers, the officers in complying to the MAPO requirements to prevent uh, being, ship being detained or any form of uh, uh, misalignment from what the international requ requirement is, it is, is. So for seafarers, we are actually ready. It depends on what the administrator is actually coming for. So and people coming from the schools as well, they need to be trained. They need to have this uh, knowledge beforehand. So all these have to be, uh, they, they need to have them in their syllabus. That's the, 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 the school syllabus on the requirements, what is the need, and what is the expectation of the seafarers. Now, uh, Captain Oluwa Shegun, uh, just take us through some of the critical challenges uh, before a Nigerian seafarer. And also, what do you think the Minister of Maritime and also Blue Economy you know, can do to help address these issues? OK, uh, the seafarers uh, as a body, we have a lot of problems. But first, I will just limit it to the areas that actually concern us the most. Number one is the disconnect between the seafarers and the regulatory body. There's a kind of disconnect. We do not have the body which actually coordinates the seafarers as a whole. We need to have all seafarers under one body. Under one body, I mean, it's not trade union, it's not the regulators. As a body which we can always report our problems to, and this problem can easily be addressed at the upper level. But what we have, is, what we have at the moment is we have the trade union, which is, a voluntary, which is voluntary to be a member or not, is not compulsory. We have the uh, different uh, um, professional bodies. So all this is kind of, we are not under the same body. So that's why you see that there's a kind of misalignment in our request. There's a kind of disconnect in our relationship with the NIMASA. And so all this has to be addressed. And at the same time, the education of seafarers. If you look at uh, the present situation right now, 
the, uh, the requirements and the training in seafarers, the skills we acquire, does not have an equivalent in the conventional education. So it's like no matter how much years you spend in the school, no matter how much experience you have, no matter how much skills you have, as soon as you leave the sea, it's all going with you. So the Nigeria tends to, uh, in other countries, we have whatever skills you have, it uh, has an equivalent. And Nigeria as a, as a country also have the national skill qualification framework. So NEMASA needs to align the certificate of competency and seafarers training with the NSQF under the National Board of Technical Education. Talking about NEMASA, how do you think they have fared in its core function of shipping development? Well, the NEMASA is really doing our best, but uh, I'll tell you the, the NEMASA still have a lot to do as far as seafaring is concerned. The NEMASA has a lot of responsibility, which includes the search and rescue, shipping development, uh, shipping reg uh, registration of ships, uh, prevention of pollution, safety, uh, security, a lot of responsibility. The NEMASA needs to also look at the seafaring. There's a stereotype, even within the NEMASA, on the mariners, on the seafarers. And these are the people, the set of people who are actually there to drive the, the mandate of the NEMASA. So if the NEMASA as a body needs, it needs to understand the grading of the seafarers and give them a proper support. So as far as seafarer aid is concerned, the NEMASA is, is really doing well in other aspects. But on the seafaring part, there's a lot more that needs to be done. All right, thank you so much for your time on the news, Captain Akombi Oluwa Shegun. Thank you for your kind company. You're welcome. The Minister of the Federal Capital Territory, Yesom Wike, has assured residents that there is no going back for the May 29th commissioning date of the Abuja Metro Line project. Wike, while inspecting ongoing construction of the access road to the train, made this known, saying that the line will pose immense benefits to residents and also reduce congestion, congestions of vehicles within the center city. Amadine Oyi reports. It was an inspection tour of the access roads connecting train stations along the Abuja metro line. The minister of the FCT, from Wiki, received updates from the contractors and the engineers on site. And this bridge is about 300 meters. This we pass and then cross the road. The, the foundations have been completed. Only one exits that fall within the current inside the uh, road. What are they going to do? And it's the clearance they need for each pier, which our provision satisfies. So we only need them the time they will not be uh, in operation. Or we take a holiday, maybe one week or two or two so that we can sink those three piers, crossing them so that we can continue. The alignment we ask them to use is along the rail corridor. Here they came through here and they want to come in between this. Yes. So our people are saying, let's maintain along the rail corridor up to the mirror. And that is the position we have stood by. Well, he says that while construction is ongoing at the site, the FCT administration is committed to constructing quality access roads to ease citizens using the line. If you do not create access roads for the communities who will be using this uh, uh, metro line in the various stations, then the aim is uh, defeated. You can imagine if this access road is done there, how would they use this station to even go to the city? He also adds that there is no going back on the May commissioning dates saying the metro line will pose immense benefits to citizens. We want to fulfill the promise we have made to Mr. President and the residents of Abuja that God willing, God willing, everything be the equal who will use the metro line. And for me, it is a major breakthrough so that this can reduce the influx of vehicles to the city. and. It's going to help us a lot. The minister assured those present that there is no cause for alarm in regards to the funding of the project, saying provisions have already been made in the statutory budget of the federal capital and the nation's 2024 budget. In Abuja for News Central, I am Amadine Uyi.
The Senate on Wednesday summoned Governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, Mr. Ola Yemi Kadoso, over the free fall of the Naira and the hyperinflation. The summon was through its committee on banking, insurance, and other financial institutions headed by Senator Adito Kumbai Bureau. The governor and his team were asked to appear on Tuesday next week to explain the state of the economy and the free flow of the Naira at the Forex market. The committee at the meeting on Wednesday expressed concern over the endless decline of the Naira that saw it rise to 1,520 Naira to a U.S. dollar as of Wednesday. Speaking with journalists after the meeting held behind closed door at the National Assembly, Senator Iberu said the state of the economy, especially the inflation index, was of great concern to the lawmakers. Motorists and other road users in Lagos State, southwest Nigeria, have called on the Lagos State government to intervene and regulate what they term recklessness and lawlessness by commercial tricycle operators in the state, otherwise known as Keke Riders. Now, this comes as the State Traffic Management Authority, in an exclusive interview with News Centre, says it will deal with anyone constituting a nuisance on the Lagos Road. Bernard Akidi has details. They have always been in operation in Lagos, plying streets and residential areas. But following the government's restriction of commercial motorcycles on highways and in other areas, Keke riders have now increased in numbers and in some cases are constituting nuisance. From indiscriminate dropping off and picking up of passengers to disobeying traffic lights and even driving against oncoming traffic. The activities of some Keke riders in the state has now become a huge cause for concern. Keke might break traffic light everywhere in Lagos. Everybody knows. Uh, small, uh, this small, small bus, this small bus at your back. So they break, they don't obey traffic light. Police cannot arrest them. Last month cannot arrest them. You know why? Another why? Because there's, there's a money every day. Give it to them. The person who cannot collect money for their hand, eh, collect money for their hand every day. You now say you want to arrest them for traffic light. You can't do that. That's the problem we have in Lagos. Okay, like me now, I stay in Magodo. So how do I? How do I do it? Not all uh, buses entered Magodo, unless the, these uh, blue ones, and sometimes they might not be available. So the only thing you can do is to ban keke. So I can't really say we should ban them, but the only thing is that we give them orientation. But the question must be asked, are the laws governing keke users different from those of other vehicle users? It's still the same law that covers activities of all motoring public across the state, including trucks and uh, uh, tankers, in which you cannot rule out these uh, minibuses as well. Their nuisance value is increasing on daily basis, on an hour basis. But of course, our enforcement team is not relaxing on his house. Many of the Keke riders actually do know traffic rules, but in a bid to sometimes avoid multiple taxation, especially by officials of the National Union of Road Transport Workers, as well as to make excess profit, they sometimes break the law. Uh, concerning union and different different things, might be the challenge we get because we they pay a lot of money for inside this union issue. And to last month, to the amount where we say they see the trouble on the road, yeah. not the get rest of mind for the road because of last month and other things. Where will you park? If you park, anywhere you park, sometimes I'll come there, call who you say, why you park here? This place is not a wrong place to park. At the end of the day, before you know, in our office, I must pay money for inside joint. There isn't any message other than for them to make sure that they comply with the transport sector reform law in Lagos State and stop picking or dropping passengers at some designated bus stop for them not to ply one way, for them not be converting streets or side roadside into a, a, a parking, a garage, where they will, they will line up and start calling passengers. They should not fly BRT corridor, they should obey the traffic light, they should, not, they, they, they should ensure that at any point in time they are not found on the intersection line. Lagos road users can only look to the appropriate authorities to continue to enforce traffic laws so as to rid the state of lawlessness of these keke riders so that unfortunate road incidences can be avoided. In Lagos for News Central, I'm Bernard Akede. In the meantime, the Central Bank of Nigeria has ordered deposit money banks to sell their excess dollar stock latest February 1st, 2024, as part of moves to stabilize the nation's volatile exchange rate. 
The CBN, which made the disclosure in a new secular release on Wednesday, also warned lenders against hoarding excess foreign currencies for profit. According to officials, the central bank believes some commercial banks hold long-term foreign exchange positions to enable them profit from the volatile movement of exchange rate. The new circular introduces a set of guidelines aimed at reducing the risks associated with these practices. The latest circular came barely 48 hours after the CBN released a circular warning banks and FX dealers against reporting false exchange rate, among others. And to talk about these, I've been joined live by the development uh, CEO, Ashiro Dynamic Solutions, Mokhtar Mohammed. Good afternoon from here. Glad to have you join me. Thank you. Good afternoon. All right, let's get straight into it. Now, what impact can this summon of the Apex Bank have? Well, I, I wish it would have a positive impact. And I think I've been an advocate where I've been saying that why don't you get the bank involved in the uh, FX market? Why can't I move, go into my bank and look at um, the, the board and see how much the exchange is? How much a naira is, is changing for a dollar, and then I change it right inside the bank. Why must I go to the street to meet a BTC uh, businessman that I risk myself? I think for me, it's a good move. Um, if you are saying that the bank should get involved in a effort to have excess liquidity, but we must not forget again, it's central bank is silent because they also central bank are owning the banks some effects that they have not given to them also. So they should also address that side of it. Now, its impact will be very positive if um, it, it sees the light of the day, like I said. Um, it could bring down the exchange rate. But again, like I said, the, the, the bank where it, before now, the CBN was saying that um, the bank should not, uh, their revaluation of the exchange rate, they shouldn't use that to pay shareholders. They shouldn't use it for personal uh, causes. So by now, you are telling them those excess effects, they have to sell it. So if they sell it to the market, they want to have Naira. Are you going to tell them to just keep the Naira or will they break the Naira into the system? And if they do that, that will create another monster that is called inflation. So how are you going to balance up this? So it's a big um, 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 ask for the CBM. But uh, hopefully when you have your own uh, currency, it's easy to, to manage your own currency than money ex um, uh, external um, currency. Maybe that's where, where we might end up in. Mm. Well, Mr. Mohammed, some are saying the CBN has probably uh, come to its wit's end and is fighting so hard to keep the Naira afloat. Is that what you think? I totally agree. I totally agree. Um, if they come, uh, within their giving banks ultimatum, within 24 hours, you have to exit your excess liquidity. And, you know, the challenge is that some of this liquidity are not even in the country because banks, some of these banks have offshore branches outside the shop this country. All over the all over the world. So this liquidity, are you telling them to import this liquidity into the the, the Nigeria uh, 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 market space? So it's uh, for me. I think they are beginning to run out of ideas. They are trying to use administrative means, but the only means that can stabilize the naira is when you use economy means that will have to do with demand and supply, be able to meet up uh, legitimate demand and also be able to meet up in terms of supply. So. They, they need to up their game. Mm. Well, let's take a look at the just released guidelines. First of all, do you think they are entirely new? Well, I don't think they're entirely new. That's, that's basically, I don't think they're entirely new. The only new thing about it is because of, uh, you said now, they must bring it to the autonomous exchange market. That's the only, that's the only thing that is new about it. it. It has always been like that because what we've seen is that sometimes banks now, normally have liquidity in uh, in FX, in dollars. Most of them use that to acquire uh, offshore branches, and they are also have offshore branches. So they use that as uh, another means of shareholder forms to, to, to acquire uh, offshore branches, like what we have seen Access Bank do of recent, acquiring a lot of, of um, banks outside the shop of this country. They cannot be acquiring those banks using Naira. They have to use dollars. So definitely some of them have these dollars assets, but they are not even in this country. And even when they do have, they use it to, for other means of investment in terms of expansion. Mm. Now, FBN Holdings has notified the investing public of a change in its board, uh, announcing Olofemi Peter Tedola as its new chairman. What do you make of that? 
I mean, when you started to look at me, Peter, I thought that I was wondering because mm -hmm. we always know him as Femi Otodola. <laughs> but again, I, I think it, um, it, it's, it's something that we saw coming. Remember uh, the issue of who has the largest share, does not have the largest share. I think finally that has been put to rest. Uh, FBN Holdings have not been able to pay their uh, dividend to their shareholder because of this case that's in court. Hopefully, with the coming on board of Femi Otodola, they will be able to resolve that. Um, it's, it's exciting investors because Otodola has been investor friendly in most of the companies that he has run. So the investors of uh, FBN Holding are beginning to see light at the end of the tunnel because uh, they've been one uh, um, uh, shareholder that have not really enjoyed in terms of dividend payout or the way the banks were run. But again, um, it's not like uh, Guregu or Forta Oil or any other establishment that uh, uh, Femi, Femi Otodola has been, because now you have a regulator, which is the CBN. So those results, we still have to go to the CBN to approve. So it's not going to be that easy like what you have in other sector where you play. But again, I think uh, it's a good development for, for, the, for, the, for, the, for the banking sector. I mean, especially for FBN holding, also for their shareholders. And the market has responded positively to that news because FBN holding is trading. At, at, at again this afternoon. All right, thank you so much for your expertise on the news. Mokhtar Mohammed, CEO, Asher Dynamics, thank you once again. My pleasure, thank you. Burkina Faso's military backed president says Russian troops could be deployed to fight jihadists in the West African country if needed. In an interview, Ibrahim Traore said Russia was offering logistical and tactical training and was willing to sell whatever weapons were required by Burkina Faso. He said there were no restrictions on what could be bought from Russia, China, Turkey or Iran, or like other countries. His comments comes amid reports that some 100 Russian fighters were last week sent to the African country as military instructors. This development also fuels speculation of Burkina Faso deepening security ties with Russia, like neighboring Mali, where Russian Wagner mercenaries operate. And now let's turn to the east of the continent, where Sudan's nine-month-old war has so far largely spurred the country's east, uh, but with the front line inching ever close and reports of military training camps across the border in Eritrea, the fragile peace there is in jeopardy. According to United Nations experts, the war has already killed thousands, including between 10,000 and 15,000 in a single city in the western Darfur region. The war pits Sudan's army, Chief Abdel Fattah al-Abahan, against his former deputy, Mohamed Hamdan Daglo, who is also known as Hemeti, who commands the Paramilitary Rapid Support Forces, RSF. Analysts have said the RSF is backed by the United Arab Emirates, which denies supporting the paramilitaries who have conquered large swathes of Sudan during fierce battles in central, western, and southern regions. Ethiopian rebel group Oromo Liberation Army has burnt vehicles that ignored its calls for a transport strike in the populous Oromia region. Reports say many businesses, including banks and government offices, have been closed since the strike was declared on Monday. Now, several trucks were destroyed in various parts of Oromia during the strike that also left some civilians injured. The rebel group claims to fight for self-determination of the Oromo people, Ethiopia's largest ethnic group. It was, it was designated a terrorist organization by the Ethiopian Organization of Federal Parliament in May 2021. In the south of the continent, former President Edgar Lungu of Zambia, Zambia has urged citizens to demand early elections, accusing his successor, uh, President Hakainde Chilema, of economic mismanagement. Addressing the media from the opposition camp, Lungu emphasized the urgency of the Zambians to pressure the president into agreeing to an early vote. Lungu also criticized Hichilema's handling of the cholera outbreak, which has resulted in nearly 600 deaths since October. However, the government spokesperson, Cornelius Umweta, swiftly dismissed Lunga's claim, urging citizens to grant President Hichilema sufficient time to fulfill his electoral promises. Umweta further accused Lungu of damaging the economy during his six-year tenure. Lungu's recent return to politics in October prompted the government to revoke his retirement benefit. 
He has retired from politics as at 2021 after suffering a crushing defeat in a presidential election. And South Africa's Foreign Minister Nalendi Pandor has denied allegations the ruling ANC party received financial backing from Iran to file its case against Israel at the International Court of Justice, ICJ. Now, during a press briefing on Wednesday, the minister termed the allegations as a counter-offensive by Israel and its allies, echoing earlier comments by President Cyril Maposa that his country could face retaliation for pursuing legal action against Israel. Last week, ICJ delivered a ruling in the case, saying that Israel must take all measures to prevent genocidal act in Gaza. The minister also said that she had complained to the ICJ over its slow pace of action on South Africa's referral against Israel, including the, including the delay in the arrest of the Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu. Now, health ministers from the Southern African Development Community have rejected a proposal to declare cholera a public health emergency in the region. The Africa Center for Disease Control, CDC, board chairperson Sylvia Masebo said individual countries should independently decide whether to declare the cholera outbreak as a health emergency or not. And speaking during the CDC extraordinary session in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, Masebo, who is also Zambia's health minister, urged member states to develop pro proactive interventions to curb the spread of the current outbreak. She said the outbreak had affected about 15 SADC member states. Zambia is among countries battling the worst outbreak in decades, and nearly 600 deaths and more than 16,000 cases reported since last October. Former U.S. President Donald Trump met leaders of one of the country's largest labor union on Wednesday, as he seeks the backing of Blue Collar America in his bid for a stalling White House return. The sit-down with the International Brotherhood of Team Stars in Washington came with Trump hoping to leech away support for the Democratic President Joe Biden among manual laborers as the pair looks set for a rematch in November's election. Now, Trump is leading a former South Carolina governor, Nikki Haley, comfortably after the two opening contests in the Republican primary and is expected to be anointed as the party's standard bearer at each convention. Strong meeting with the Teamsters. Uh, over the years, I've employed thousands and thousands of Teamsters, and they've done a great job, especially in New York, where we have uh, a lot of unions. I've had great relationships with the unions. Uh, we're with Sean O'Brien, as you know, and Fred Zuckerman, and they're terrific people, great leaders, actually. And I think we had a very productive meeting. Stranger things have happened. Uh, usually, a Republican wouldn't get that endorsement. For many, many years, they've they only do Democrats, but in my case, it's different because I've employed thousands of Teamsters, and I thought we should come over and pay our respects. Nigeria's Minister of Aviation and Aerospace Development, Festus Kayamo, has revealed that the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission is currently investigating the controversial Nigeria air deal that was sealed by his predecessor, Hadi Sidika. Kayamo made this disclosure during an interview in Lagos. He emphasized that there is an ongoing criminal investigation and that he has requested a report on the matter. Kiyama also states that the government will not designate any local airline as a national carrier, but rather establish a proper national carrier. Nigeria's oil minister, Henneke Lopobiri, has expressed the country's desire to address the unresolved issues surrounding the disputed OPL245 oil block in order to attract investments to its oil and gas industry. Now, talks have been held with Shell and Eni to discuss the matter. The minister reiterated that the government and other parties involved in the oil block deal bear no criminal liability despite years of litigation surrounding the issue. In November, Nigeria withdrew a $1.1 billion civil claim against Shell and Eni related to corruption allegations in the deal, effectively ending all legal disputes over the oil asset. The government aims to resolve the problems surrounding the OPL245, which has seen no investment for 28 years in a manner that benefits all parties involved. Meetings have taken place, including in London, to address the matter.
The Kenyan government is planning to utilize a mini budget schedule for March to pay contractors and settle pending, pending bills worth over 630 billion Kenyan shillings. Kenya's Treasury Permanent Secretary, Chris Kipto, announced that the committee responsible for verifying the bills will present the initial list of claims by mid March, enabling the inclusion of those dues in the supplementary budget. State entities owe a significant amount to firms and contractors, with state corporations accounting for 509.37 billion Kenyan shillings and ministries, departments and agencies responsible for the remaining 121.19 billion Kenyan shillings. The government aims to complete the verification process within a year and has a set deadline of mid-March for the committee to provide its first report. The rest of the pending bills will be settled based on available fiscal resources. The public entities have until, have until Friday to submit details of their pending bills for verification to the committee for the audit and subsequent settlement. And that's all on the news at this hour. But before we go, let's take a look again at some of the major stories. Central Bank of Nigeria has ordered banks to sell excess dollars in 24 hours. Burkina Faso junta leader has mauled deployment of Russian troops to the country. We also told you that South African Development Community has rejected calls to declare cholera health emergency in the region. Send your eyewitness report to the WhatsApp number on the screen and follow us on social media. We are at News Central TV. You can watch us live on DSTV channel 422. Star Times Channel 274, Avo TV, and YouTube. Many thanks for watching. I am Adebola Adeduba.